Um, my name is John Kirk and I'll be chairing the session uh, this evening. Uh, the focus is on a uh, declaration by uh, President Obama about uh, Venezuela. Um, we will have three presentations and also will be joined <coughs> live by uh, the Ambassador to Canada of Venezuela through the power and mystery of technology. <laughs> um, beautiful spring day in Halifax, great time to be out and, and learning about, about Venezuela. Um, John, are you able to stand please? Yeah, sure. Well, that's short people. Okay. Uh, uh, hi, this is still John Kirk. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are joined uh, this evening by live feed uh, from Ottawa with the ambassador uh, of Canada to, uh, of Venezuela to to Canada. Um, we have three, three presentations. Uh, Isaac Saini, uh, Professor of Dalhousie, will speak on the general topic: uh, another <laughs> unforgivable revolution, Washington's war on Venezuela. Uh, uh, secondly, we will have Chris Walker, who is doing a PhD at St. Mary's University, uh, speaking on the topic Venezuela's other revolution, media portrayal, and the impact of Chavez's social movement. And then uh, Kyla Sankey, an instructor uh, and PhD student at St. Mary's and the University of Zacatecas in Mexico, will speak on Venezuela's 21st century socialism, uh, achievements and, and challenges. Um, like you to, uh, when we finish, we'll go around for any questions that you you have, and, and look forward to to an exchange. Um, the focus of this is the Summit of the Americas, uh, La Cumbre de las Americas, which takes place in Panama in a few days on the 10th and the 11th of, of April. This should have been a time for great rejoicing for Barack Obama. Uh, he had done the uh, taken the very wise move of recognizing uh, that 50 plus years of trying to use a, a boycott. Uh, an embargo of Cuba had failed. Uh, and to his credit, uh, after 10 US presidents had failed to realize that uh, they were not going to isolate Cuba, in fact, just the opposite, it was the US policy in Latin America that had been isolated, Obama had made a very, very important uh, step forward, a step forward of common sense uh, on the 17th of, of, of December. Um, the, the summit should have been a moment for great rejoicing in Washington, should have been a time for uh, uh, Washington and Latin America finally starting to, to, to make some headway. Um, it should have been a good news story. Uh, it won't be, uh, precisely because of, of, a, of a, 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 a presidential decree that was issued uh, by, by President Obama, which I will, I will cite from in, in a minute. Um, in a footnote, in the last two summits, the one that was in Trinidad and Tobago and then in, in, in Colombia, uh, with two exceptions, had insisted on Cuba's participation. Uh, Cuba will be there for the first time after the momentous first step taken on <coughs> December the, uh, the, the 17th. Two countries among the 33 refused to allow Cuba to participate, um, the U.S. Uh, and Mr. Harper's Canada. Uh, Mr. Harper has finally seen the light of, of day and, and, and reason. Um, th the situation that we're going to discuss today is the result of sanctions that have been taken against seven Venezuelan politicians accused of abusing uh, human rights. Um, and the actual statement that was issued, uh, I have it here if anyone would like to, to see it, this is the executive order <coughs> by Obama. And it starts off, um, by the authority vested in me, and he goes on, I, Barack Obama, President of the United States of America, find that the situation in Venezuela, including the government of Venezuela's erosion of human rights guarantees, persecution of political opponents, curtailment of press freedoms, use of violence and human rights violations and abuses in response to anti-government protests and arbitrary arrest and detention of anti-government protesters, as well as the ex exacerbating presence of significant public corruption. This is the, the, where it gets to be interesting constitutes an unusual and extraordinary threat to the national security and foreign policy of the United States. And I hereby declare a national emergency to deal with that threat. Talk about draconian terms. Uh, let me repeat that. Uh, an unusual and extraordinary threat to the national security and foreign policy of the United States. And I hereby declare a national emergency to deal with that threat. Uh, I, I kind of think that's a little bit over the top. Um, so, um, the, uh, the end result is that we have 
uh, now a situation in which, as we all know, this, the Venezuela is, is a very polarized society. 51% voted in favor of, of uh, Maduro in the last election, but 49% voted against. It is a polarized society. Um, we uh, significantly 51% voted for him, and it might be interesting to remember that 39.6% voted for Mr. Harper. 12% uh, more voted for Maduro than voted for, uh, for, for our prime minister. Uh, I think no one can, can argue that there is corruption. Uh, there are major economic problems and the decrease of, by over 50% in the price of oil on the world market. 88% of Venezuelan's uh, exports are crude or refined petroleum. An unacceptable level of, of violence and crime and a high rate of inflation. I, I think nobody can, can dispute that. You can dispute some of the causes. There are major problems in Venezuela, and the media, largely controlled by the right wing, has lost no opportunity to fan the flames of, of dissent. But we have here, and the focus tonight is, is on this very bizarre situation of a population of 30 million, uh, which spends 1% of its GDP on military, an army of just 120,000 being declared a, a threat to the national security of the United States. We believe that this is, is a ridiculous uh, uh, claim. The international uh, response has been overwhelmingly in support of Venezuela. At the last count, 138 countries had supported the government of Venezuela. <laughs> May I have your attention, please? Sure. The Atlantic Book Awards will begin in 15 minutes at 7 o'clock on the Paula Regan Hall on the ground floor. Thank you. Um, talking of book awards, there's a fantastic book which is being sold over here, which is definitely worth the price of admission. Uh, it was written by, 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 by Chris, Venezuela's Healthcare Revolution. It's an extraordinary book which talks both about healthcare and how it has evolved, and also about grassroots development in, in Venezuela. For $20, you too can be the proud owner of one of these copies, which are available over there, published by... Tax included. Tax included. Okay. What a deal. Um, so, so it's interesting that yesterday President Santos, uh, one of the closest allies of, uh, of the United States in Latin America, President of Colombia, uh, came out and I quote, uh, we have always said that unilateral sanctions generally are counterproductive and so we reject them. Um, I believe it would be more constructive to promote dialogue, said Washington's top ally. Uh, it's significant as well that the opposition, the MUD, the MUD, um, in, Beautiful in, acronym. Uh, the acronym, uh, uh, and this is a quotation, this was the Mesa de la Unidad Democrática said, in regards to the executive order of the President of the United States, Barack Obama, uh, entitled, uh, uh, the Mesa de la Unidad Democrática declares, quote, Venezuela is not a threat to any country. Our struggle is for a Pacific change, democratic, electoral, and constitutional. Uh, with, to be carried out in Venezuela with the Venezuelan people. So even the opposition in Venezuela sees this as being uh, a, a, a ridiculous statement on the part of the, of the U.S. Uh, uh, president. Uh, Roberta Jacobson, the Under Secretary of State for Latin America, has declared she has been quite surprised at the reaction of Latin America. She had expected people to support her. With the exception of the President of Panama and Mr. Harper, Every other Latin American president has, has agreed to support uh, the Venezuela. Uh, so the major theme then is the, the role of the United States uh, in what used, it used to see the backyard, but which uh, is no longer seen as the, as the, uh, the backyard. The, the tragedy is, um, I studied Latin America for, for several years, and it seems to me the tragedy is that what should have been a defining moment of finally coming to, to, to adopt a common sense approach to, to Latin America on the part of Washington uh, has been a complete disaster. Obama has blown it, or rather his advisors have blown it. So why is the United States doing this? How just are its claims? Does Venezuela represent, uh, quote, an extraordinary and unusual threat to national security? Um, there are two copies of a petition uh, which, if you, if you agree that you uh, do not agree with Venezuela as a, uh, an unquote, unusual and extraordinary threat to national security, undermining the right of, of each and every Venezuelan to build their destiny, uh, feel free to sign this. Larry, could you? I know you've already signed it. But, oh, Jim, could you pass that around? If anybody uh, feels that. So, so, um, and so to tonight's speakers, and if technology has not failed us, uh, we will be 
in touch, I think, with His Excellency Ambassador Wilma Omar Barrientos Fernandez in Ottawa. Uh, Señor Embajador, ¿usted está ahí? It's just ringing. Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> Premature. Eh, Señor Embajador, ¿no puede, ¿nos oye? Hola. Oh, it's on her. It's, she's in that picture. He sees her. He thinks she has a very deep voice, John. <laughs> Which is he took okay. one look at all the snow and said, I'm not, I'm not even my image is going there. Is it hooked up to the speakers? Yeah. Yeah. Where's the... <laughs> <laughs> joining us. Good evening. In honor of National Poetry Month, please join us for our author reading with poet Chad Norman. The program will begin at 7 p.m. in room 301 on the third floor. Everyone is welcome to attend. Yeah. Um, so if you get bored, the National Poetry Reading will do down, down the heart. Uh, see, see, oye? See, oye? No. <laughs> Can we do a test audio? Does he have his speakers? Right after you speak, he seems to speak, so he may be hearing us. I think he is, yeah. So that's coming out. Okay, now it's coming out here. Into somebody's driveway. Uh, this is Ottawa. <laughs> sure, no, that's not Silicon Valley. Yeah, well, Silicon Valley. While you're waiting, if you'd like to go and buy a coffee, <laughs> I'm trying hard to. Yeah. I get 10%. <laughs> Best promotion person I could hire. Yeah. <coughs> he doesn't see it. Yeah. 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 That's what he says. I know, I know. Isaac, would it be worthwhile if we can't get going with this to cut our losses and... <laughs> Bob, there's a seat over here. Oh, there's one at the back there, yeah. That's interesting. Bloody CIA. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, there is this petition going around. If you f feel free to sign it, if if you so wish. Yes, we, we move on to the program if this is... Sorry. That's okay. Does anyone interrupt them if you didn't work? See if we can get to the eventually. Did you want to keep plugging away and maybe we'll move on with the program, Kyla? Yeah, yeah. Can you call him to tell him what you're doing? Does he know we're doing that? Yeah. And maybe if anyone else is coming. Okay, um, moving right along since technology has not been the remarkable triumph we Hello. 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 Ah. <laughs> Hello. 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 Eh, señor embajador, eh, con alguna dificultad estoy viendo. Varias, sí. Sí, ahora por eh, 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 Entonces acabamos de explicar el escenario. Si usted quisiera eh, hablar, es, estamos aquí con unas 60 personas en la biblioteca central de Halifax. Si quisiera eh, dirigirnos unas palabras en inglés, por favor. Eh. Muy buenas noches, no hablo inglés, 
I don't speak English, so you have to make an effort to understand and to, to, to translate. Adelante, entonces. Quiero, quiero darle las gracias a la Universidad Dan House de Halifax y al querido profesor George King, a sus acompañantes, a Edith Sassanay, Chris Walter y Kayla Sankey. Uh, I'd like to thank eh, hoy I'd like hoy to ustedes van a hacer una conversación muy interesante sobre Venezuela. Uh, I'd like to thank the people who are participating in this uh, and Dalhousie University and St. Mary's University uh, and uh, look forward to an interesting conversation today. En el nombre del gobierno de Venezuela y del amado pueblo de Venezuela agradecemos este gesto de solidaridad con un país que se ha dispuesto a ser independiente y a ser libre y hacer respetar su soberanía. Uh, on behalf of the, the people of Venezuela and the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, I would like to uh, ex express our, our thanks to you for, uh, for showing solidarity with the people which is trying to uh, protect its independence. Como estoy seguro ustedes han venido estudiando, saben que sobre Venezuela, desde que llegó Hugo Chávez al gobierno, hay todas unas presiones internacionales porque eh, Hugo Chávez ha cambiado la forma de hacer la democracia en el país. Uh, as you will know, uh, there has been a lot of pressure against Venezuela uh, as a result of the changes in the form of democracy which have taken place since Hugo Chávez was elected in 1998. Y una vez que llegó al gobierno, eh, impulsó el poder constituyente uh, y se originó una nueva constitución. Uh, as you know, when he came to power, he pushed forward a new approach to the constitution and brought in a new constitution. Y en esa constitución se dibuja perfectamente cómo es el estado social de justicia y de derecho en el que se debe ahora convertir Venezuela. Uh, and in it is, it is explained very clearly the kind of the state, the form of justice which has to be applied in Venezuela y nos indica el camino hacia la democracia participativa y protagónica. Uh, and in a movement towards the participatory democracy uh, in Venezuela. Es decir, que comienza a tener un juego importante el pueblo, aquel pueblo que normalmente se usa nada más para que vaya eh, en ocasiones a depositar su voto. So we have a, a new role for the, for the people of Venezuela, people who instead of just going once every several years to vote, uh, are now participating in the, in the process of, of, of development in Venezuela. Y con esta democracia participativa y protagónica se comienza a organizar el pueblo desde la base. So, para que el pueblo pueda decidir sobre las políticas que va a desarrollar el gobierno. Uh, so we now have a society in which the, the participatory democracy is organized and takes place as channel from the base uh, to, to the top of the country. Y estos son cambios radicales que hacen aflorar las contradicciones en la sociedad. And these radical changes have brought about the contradictions that exist in Venezuela. Y por eso desde que Hugo Chávez asume el poder, entonces comienza toda una campaña para desprestigiarlo, para ligarlo a narcotráfico, para ligarlo a la narcoguerrilla y para inscribirlo dentro de lo que llamaron en algún momento el eje del mal. Uh, so as a result of, uh, since Chávez was elected, uh, we have had a, a campaign of disinformation to link us to narco-terrorism, to narco-guerrillas and to bring us once again to what used to be called the uh, axis of evil. Y eso nos llevó unos dos años después, a, o tres años después, al golpe de Estado, primero al paro petrolero, y después al golpe de Estado del 11 de abril del 2003. Uh, so, uh, we then had, uh, three years later, we had uh, an attempt to destroy uh, the economy through uh, pr problems at, at, uh, at, at uh, the, the, the oil industry, and then the attempt to, uh, to the, the coup d'etat attempt, uh, in April of 2003. Recuerdo que aquel paro le costó al país nada más y nada menos que 15 mil millones de dólares. The, the work, the strike that was organized uh, in, the, in the oil industry cost fi, uh, the country, the economy, 15 billion dollars. Y aquel golpe de Estado que sacó momentáneamente por 48 horas a Hugo Chávez 
y que luego el pueblo y las fuerzas armadas juntos lo repusieron en el poder. Haciendo fracasar la estrategia imperialista y de la oposición interna venezolana. This led to a failure on the part of the uh, of the imperialist forces uh, abroad and also the the opposition to Chavez uh, within uh, Venezuela. Y a partir de allí comenzaron con una nueva estrategia, a presionar la economía. Uh, y luego de esto generaron en el 2004 lo que se conoció con el término de la guarimba. Uh, so since then uh, we've had an attempt to destroy the, the economy from within the country. Y las guarimbas, ese término que en el castellano se interpreta como guarida, escondite, se convirtieron para la oposición venezolana en hechos de violencia. Uh, and as a result of the guarimba, this attempt to, to bring about uh, change, over, to overthrow, ch bring change in Cuba, uh, in, in Venezuela has led to um, major uh, uh, violence in, in the country. Y la utilizaron para trancar eh, avenidas, calles, quemar instituciones, atentar contra servicios públicos, atentar contra servicios de electricidad, atentar contra la petrolera venezolana PDVSA. Uh, so we've had a series of acts of violence that have taken place, buildings have been set afire, uh, it's been a major attempt to try to cause difficulties for the oil industry. Y esto tampoco les dio resultado en el 2004. Uh, y this, se acentuó, ¿no? This also was a failure in 2004. Y comenzó a sentarse nuevamente en el 2009 con una guerra económica que presionaba a la moneda y presionaba los productos de primera necesidad. We then had a, an economic campaign starting in 2009 uh, to bring about major economic problems for the population of Venezuela. Y hemos observado con preocupación que cada vez que hay un proceso electoral, entonces vemos que los medios internacionales, la oposición nacional, comienzan a generar climas de estados dentro del país. Whenever there has been an, an, uh, an election or a change in the constitution, we noticed how the media have taken advantage of this climate to bring about, to try to emphasize the, the insecurity in the country. So the question therefore is why? Why, after 16 years, a government that has been attacked que dicen que no es bueno con el pueblo, que es dictador, que es opresor, que es una dictadura, porque aún así, en el 7 de octubre del 2012, Hugo Chávez llega nuevamente a ganar las elecciones con el 55% del respaldo electoral. So the country is often presented uh, as a dictatorship, it is a very evil place. Uh, yet, despite the, the campaign of disinformation on October the 7th, 2012, uh, Hugo Chávez was elected with 55% of the popular vote. En otra época pudiésemos decir, como se decía de muchos países latinoamericanos, que era un proceso electoral con un sistema electoral fraudulento. It, it could be said, as in the case of many other countries, it could have been claimed that this was a fraudulent process as has often taken place in other Latin American countries. Pero oh, en 16 años de revolución se ha sometido Venezuela, creo que a una de las mayores expresiones de la democracia, 18 procesos electorales, de los cuales en la revolución ha salido victoriosa en 17. Um, but in actual fact, in between presidential elections and changes to the constitution, there have been uh, there have been 18 occasions when Venezuela has gone to the to the to the to the population to vote, and the the government has won on 17 of the 18. Y este sistema electoral ha sido reconocido como un sistema eh, eh, excelente, poco vulnerable, por la Unión Europea, por la UNASUR, por el 
Centro Carter de los Estados Unidos, que ha, quien ha dicho que en Venezuela hay un sistema eh, de muy buena calidad y que hay una verdadera democracia. Y esa democracia hace falta en los Estados Unidos. Um, and in fact, the system of, of the, the electoral system we have in Venezuela has been uh, approved uh, by uh, the European Union, by UNASUR, uh, by the Carter Institute. In fact, Jimmy Carter, President Jimmy Carter, said uh, that this was an excellent system, a system that w would be, could, that actually could be, would be beneficial in the United States. Y no conforme con eso de haber eh, obtenido procesos electorales victoriosos, llegamos así al 14, al 14 de abril, donde luego de la muerte de nuestro comandante eterno, gana el presidente Nicolás Maduro. Uh, then we come to the 14th of April, when after the death of, of uh, President Hugo Chávez, uh, Maduro was elected as president. Y vuelven a salir con el grito de que salgamos a la calle, no nos vamos de la calle hasta que no se vaya Maduro. Uh, then we have people taken to the streets, we won't leave until Maduro goes. Esa es verdaderamente el sentimiento de un demócrata. Esas expresiones dirigidas a los que ellos consideran que lideran. Is this the, the, the feeling of, of, uh, of true democracy? No, allí no hay demócratas. No, they are not democrats. Allí lo que hay son unos hipócritas que hablan de democracia cuando les conviene. They are rather hypocrites who speak about democracy when it is to their advantage. Pero cuando ellos estuvieron en el poder nunca se acordaron de los más humildes, los más necesitados por los que vino luchando Hugo Chávez. Uh, but when they were in power they did not uh, remember, they did not think about the, the, the humble people, uh, uh, the people who uh, benefited uh, by and supported uh, Hugo Chávez. ¿Han ustedes escuchado hablar en las grandes cadenas transnacionales de la comunicación de las miles de casas que se están construyendo en el país a precio solidario? ¿Han ustedes escuchado hablar en los medios de comunicación los médicos que ahora están enregados en cada uno de los barrios y viven allí para atender al pueblo humilde con dándole medicamentos gratis? Uh, have, you, you, I doubt if you've read about the, the thousands of houses that have been built uh, for working people or for the medical services which are up now uh, throughout the country providing medical services uh, freely. Y han ustedes visto cómo, a pesar de la guerra económica tremenda que tienen contra el país, hemos mantenido las 42 misiones, porque gracias a 42 misiones hemos logrado llevar de 600.000 estudiantes que habían educación superior a 2.600.000 estudiantes. Um, so despite the economic war which has taken place, we have maintained the 42 social programs, the, the misiones, and as a result, 2.6 million students have received uh, a free education. Y a la educación le damos una importancia tremenda, porque Hugo Chávez entendió que se pueden construir hermosos centros comerciales y avenidas, pero no se podrá cambiar entonces la conciencia de un pueblo, y es a través de la educación que se forma y se instruye a un pueblo. Uh, Hugo Chávez realized that you can build all the fancy shopping centers in the world, but really the most important thing is to develop an awareness, a conciencia uh, of, 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 the, of the people of Venezuela. Y saben qué, queridos compañeros, ustedes que me oyen allí, que están estudiando a profundidad estos problemas, una de las cosas que le teme el mundo desarrollado es a un pueblo organizado y a un pueblo eh, con nuevos criterios educativos. Uh, so many people are, are afraid of how the, the, the combination of an organized people uh, with new ways of thinking, new ways of bringing about development. Recuerden en el año 2005 fuimos decretados por la ONU, eh, territorio libre del analfabetismo. Uh, Un millón, casi 500 mil venezolanos eh, volvieron la luz, eh, conocieron la realidad, pudieron ir a leer para ver una realidad que antes se la escondían. En 2005, the United Nations uh, declared uh, that 1.5 million Venezuelans were now uh, literate, uh, people who had been uh, in, unable to read before. Usted sabe lo orgulloso que yo me siento cuando subo a un cerro o a un barrio de gente humilde y uno habla con ellos y tienen una conciencia política histórica de profundidad 
a que le generó Hugo Chávez a través de su programa a los presidentes. Uh, it is very, for me, very gratifying to go to some of the poorer areas uh, to be able to speak with people and to see the level of political consciousness that they have as a result of education programs which they didn't have before but were able to have access to under Hugo Chavez. Les hago todo este recuento para que puedan entender lo que ustedes van a discutir en profundidad. I give you the, this information as a basis for the discussion which you will now be having. Yo apenas hace tres meses llegué de Venezuela. Uh, I just arrived here three months ago from Venezuela. Y, y presentan por aquí, por algunos medios de comunicación, que parece que Venezuela eh, fuera un país en guerra, que se está cayendo, que nos estamos matando uno con otro. Eso no es verdad. Uh, the, the image that's given in the media, well, since I've been here, is that of, of Venezuela as a country that's on, on, on a war footing with violence on, on every block. No, that, that's not true. Pero no me gustaría que me lo creyeran a mí, que fuera. Perhaps we should move, move on. Um, could, could you explain to, to him that perhaps we now have the historical background, we will move to the... Hello. Va. Arrigo. De la... The CIA is at work clearly here. The CSIS. Um, what I'd like to do now is to pass along the uh, baton to, to Isaac Saini uh, from Dalhousie University, who will be providing some historical context. Isaac? The, the Obama administration's actions against Venezuela are outrageous and a flagrant violation of international law and the norms of relations between nations. John has given you some um, details in terms of reading out some of the statements of the United States. And for many people, the Obama's implementation of these sanctions against Venezuela, your seven officials, seem incomprehensible. Uh, this aggressive policy uh, seems to be something that seems utterly incomprehensible. I hope I think that's important to view it in a historical context of uh, the U.S.'s, the United States' in, um, interaction, engagement with Latin America. Nevertheless, we must understand and recognize these attacks on Venezuela are a continuation of the historic pattern of U.S. policies of interference and intervention in Latin America and the Caribbean, aimed at an undermining the negation of Latin American independence, sovereignty, and the right to self-determination. Many of you may be familiar with the concept of manifest destination, uh, sort of like a justification, a rationale, a philosophy that was created to justify the idea that the United States was um, sort of uh, divinely ordained to spread so-called civilization, uh, peace, order, and gov government to the so-called benighted and often darker peoples of Latin America and the Caribbean. And, and so this was used as a, a justification. We have the idea, John also mentioned, that for a very long time, Latin America was considered to be the natural, inevitable, and, uh, and inescapable, and forever backyard of the United States. There's a long list of U.S. intervention in Latin America and the Caribbean. I could spend time going over them, but I won't uh, suffice it to say that before World War II, there were four military interventions, and these are the military interventions in Cuba. We have Puerto Rico, op um, occupied from 1898 to the present. We had five military interventions in Nicaragua. In fact, we had you know, one lasting from 1912 to 1925. Four military interventions in Colombia, seven in Honduras, four in the Dominican Republic, two in Haiti, and you know, we could argue there's one going on right now. And Haiti was actually had a military occupation from US troops from 1915 to 1934, three in Mexico, and one in Guatemala, and, one, and two in Panama. After World War II, the history of repeated intervention includes CI orchestrated coups against democratic governments in Chile, Brazil, uh, Chile in 1973, Brazil in 1964, Guatemala in 1954, there was a 1965 invasion of the Dominican Republic, there's the invasion of Grenada in 1983, and in 1980s we have the Reagan regime's funding and support of the Contra war to overthrow Nicaragua's government. Really, it was sort of like a, a, a Contra's war of terror. Uh, and a 55-year-old economic embargo against Cuba, including tacit and complicit support for attacks against Cuba by various terrorist groups that have cost over 3,000 lives uh, um, in Cuba. 
This is not to mention Operation Condor, which was a CIA operation, which I include everybody to read about, in which Washington collaborated with the military fascist dictatorships that the US had collaborated in putting into power. Uh, these military dictatorships, in concert with the CIA, tortured, murdered, and lacerated the flesh, minds, and spirits of the progressive and justice-loving and seeking forces across the Americas. Today, for example, uh, one of the most notorious examples of Operation Condor, sort of it's like it's one of its fecal remains, and I say that quite openly, is uh, the terrorist Luis Posada Carreras, who walks free to the streets of Miami, a man responsible for innumerable terrorist acts in the regions, including torch in Venezuela in the 1970s and blowing up a Cuban civilian airline in 1976 that cost 73 lives. In 2002, uh, the regime of George H.W. Bush supported and assisted in organizing the coup to overthrow Hugo Chavez. From the election of Chavez in 1998 to the present, Washington has financed and connived to the opposition to bring down the Bolivarian government, despite the repeated victories at the ballot box by Chavez and his, su and his successor. So as the um, ambassador pointed out, and I'm sure that the other presenters will point out, there have been 18 elections since Chavez came to power. He's won and, and Maduro, and, there's the, and the Bolivarian forces have won 17 of them. Uh, it bears noting that Venezuela's elections have been described as the fairest and most democratic in the region. Uh, Carter, as, um, as, John, as John pointed out, Carter Center, among others, have pointed out that they're free and fair. The domestic opposition to Chavez and now Maduro is based in the wealthy oligarchy that ruled the country since the early 19th century. Through their control of the state, they control the country's wealth. They became rich through corruption and outright theft, while the majority of the population, the despised working masses, the denigrated mixed race, black and indigenous population were deprived, impoverished, and immiserated. And it's important to know the state was used as a siphon of funds into the coffers of the oligarchy. Under Chavez, the Bolivarian Revolution redistributed wealth and used the country's immense riches for social development, building infrastructure, and so forth. Poverty was reduced by more than 50%, despite the problems that exist in Venezuela. But in, in inevitably, Chavez's policies and actions incurred the wrath of the parasitic oligarchy, and in this case, the United States. In Washington eyes, Venezuela um, became, to use William Blum's phrase, the unforgivable revolution. When it, when it, Venezuela does, as the, the Cuban Revolution, and as the Cuban Revolution does, represents an unacceptable challenge to US hegemony. Washington stand, standing as a hegemonic power is based on its capacity to maintain and demonstrate control of its own hemispheric community, i.e. its backyard. Venezuela is an undeniable and visible breach of this system. Thus, a central object of US policy is the destruction and eradication of the Bolivarian government and revolution. And one only has to read journals such as Foreign Affairs and uh, uh, many of the editorials that appeared in papers that when Chavez was elected and began to organize sort of a group of nations around him, as I'll talk about in a, in a little bit, many nations considered this to be a fundamental challenge to US imperialism and true US world power. And many said that the US had to reassert its control of Latin America, its natural American backyard, its natural area where it could control control and exercise almost undivided and unchallenged authority. So Venezuela is as an undeniable and visible breach of this system of US control. Thus, a central object of US policy is the destruction and eradication of the Bolivarian government and revolution. Integral to this aim are the propaganda and disinformation campaigns waged by the media under the direct and indirect control of the United States to isolate Venezuela in the hope of leaving it defenseless as a prelude to a final bellicose act. The underlying logic driving the imperialist system is the lust for expansion and domination. What defines and determines this logic is the rush to secure and cement a worldwide open door for capital and commerce, the integration of societies within the capitalist political and economic order, and the maintenance of a US-dominated uh, capitalist world. Venezuela challenges this drive for US hegemony. As was, as, you know, as I said, I had more quotes to sort of, but I want to move things on quickly, but it's clearly by various policymakers in US ruling circles. The loss of control of Latin America was considered a very significant blow to US global ambitions. Venezuela, together with the historic and concrete symbol of the Cuban Revolution's inspiration and resilience, inspired a new wave of anti-imperialism and progressive forces across Latin America. Just as the existence of the Russian Revolution triggered revolutionary activity across Europe and the world, the, Venezuela, the Vene Venezuela's Bolivian, Bolivarian Revolution, coupled with the Cuban Revolution, has been an objective force against imperialism. The formation of regional associations such as ALBA and particularly CELAC, uh, CELAC, uh, CELAC which explicitly include the US, uh, exclude the US, epitomized and Canada, epitomize the Latin American Caribbean drive to achieve authentic independence and self-determination. The throw off the yoke of US imperialism that strangles our America, as Jose Marti said, Nuestra America. It must be stressed that this Latin American Caribbean
and determination that control their destiny has deep historical roots. Tupac Katari, Toussaint Louverture, Simon Bolivar, and Jose Marti are just a few of these profound exa examples. And I think it's also important to understand that the U.S. will be um, deploying a new special forces, which will, which will be based um, um, in a, a part, partly in Peru and in other countries, aimed specifically, as similar to AFRICOM and so forth, estab to establishing U.S. hegemony once again in Latin America. And, um, um, and I think it's also important, I want to quote um, um, from Ivan um, Gollinger, there's an article included in the No Harbor Four newsletter, where she says, and many people, when they saw that Obama, for example, on December 17, 2014, was basically acknowledging that the U.S. would take steps to the eventual normalization of relations with Cuba, acknowledging that this over 55-year policy of aggression and hostility and attempt to isolate Cuba had failed, that maybe a new page was, uh, was being turned. Of course, what the U.S. had recognized, and we can have this discussion, was that this policy had failed and they adopted a new uh, series of tactics that acquired the same, uh, achieved the same strategic objective, which is a destruction and undermining of the Cuban Revolution. Venezuela, however, um, is seen in a different light, not because Venezuela is, um, is seen differently than Cuba, but Venezuela is seen to be more vulnerable uh, to this kind of um, sanctions that the United States have imposed. But as Gollinger points out, the White House has miscalculated regional policies and priorities once again, underestimating the importance of sovereignty, independence, and solidarity that as um, the power they hold for the people of Latin America. And she goes on to quote that Ecuadorian President Rafael Correa tweet tweeted that the Obama doctrine must be a bad joke, recalling how such an outrageous action, quote, reminds us of the darkest hours of our Latin America when we received invasions and dictatorships imposed by imperialism. Will they understand that Latin America has changed? And it seems impossible <laughs> that they have understood that Latin America has changed. They do not understand that Latin <clears throat> America has, in, has in, entered a new phase. So Venezuela has been a very active agent in carrying out this change, carrying on the ideological and political struggle against imperialism. Venezuelan Bolivian social development, but um, uh, for example, and Vela, uh, have also critically augmented the revolutionary consciousness and culture, the human factor that has been in in essential basis for the political advances that have been made in these South American nations. Caracas has been an active force for building unity of awareness, unity of consciousness, and now the beginning of unity in action. And I think this is represented in the formation of these regional organizations, but also in the overwhelming support for Venezuela in Latin America and the Caribbean, but it's also very interesting across the world. As, as John pointed out, 138 nations have stood forcefully with Venezuela against these illogical, crazy sanctions. But if you understand them in terms of the US attempt to restore its hegemony, they make perfect sense. Um, from an imperialist standpoint. Okay. Venezuela, in short, has been, along with Cuba, both the symbolic and the concrete anchor for the development of this new wave of Latin American struggles. <coughs> the United States is seeking to turn back the wheel of history, to push a Latin American and Caribbean back to when they were simply uh, uh, appendages of the United States. A new phase has arrived in Latin American and Caribbean consciousness, and I don't think they're going to go back into the dustbin of history uh, that quietly and so forth. And whether you stand with Venezuela or not, whether you support the Bolivarian Revolution or not, one has to stand against intervention, foreign intervention in the affairs of the people of Latin America and the Caribbean. It's a fundamental right, and it's a fundamental right for them to defend themselves against this kind of outrageous intervention in their affairs. Okay, Uh, moving right along, we have here uh, to my right, uh, Chris Walker, who is uh, a PhD student at St. Mary's University. Uh, will be speaking on the topic, Venezuela's other revolution, media portrayal and the impact of Chavez's social movement. Well, thank you, John, and thank you, Isaac. I'm not sure I can keep up with that kind of pace, though. <laughs> That's a lot of information. I like, don't speak fast. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, so my experience with Venezuela was... Uh, over three months and 40 interviews about um, with both sides of the political spectrum. And it's very important to go to, to Venezuela and speak with both sides because it, it, there really is hardly any middle ground, hardly, hardly sort of any critical dialogue happening between either side. Um, and so you always have to sort of place everything within this dichotomy within Venezuela. And it's interesting that even though Mud and Santos in Colombia have come out to say you know, they're against this. There's still members within within the uh, Venezuelan opposition that would welcome sort of U.S. intervention. So to be cognizant of that is that the opposition is very fragmented with itself. You know, some people support Capriles, some pe people are more leaning towards Leopoldo Lopez. 
And so there's a complex sort of interplay going on there right now. So it's interesting to think that where everything is polarized, you think that a country would unite against intervention uh, by the U.S. given the track record of, say, Libya, um, Iraq, Afghanistan, where both sides of the political spectrum, I think, in, in any of those countries would agree it hasn't gone out so well. It hasn't gone so well for them given what the U.S. has done, what the U.S. has left them over the, you know, in some cases over 12, 15 years. So it's important to keep that in mind that uh, the U.S. does have allies sort of within this process and the, the opposition. There is some leaning towards obviously not wanting U.S. In intervention in, the, in a case of sort of cerebral consciousness that MUD did. But uh, there are people within the Venezuelan opposition that somehow still see this as a partisan topic and that they have to choose a side. And if the Chavistas are against U.S. intervention, well, they have to be with U.S. intervention, right? So it's complex, uh, and, it's, and it's fairly sad to see that this can actually take place in the U.S. It's given sort of this vote of confidence with uh, the people that they're working with, obviously, inside Venezuela. And it's as, as Isaac Saini has pointed out, this is very much a war on ideas, a war on the representation of what is, uh, Venezuela and Cuba uh, is within the hemisphere, the backyard of the United States. And so this example is something that they they don't really want to get out, and they do want access to that oil. I mean, it's, it's pretty transparent. When you look at who they're allies with and who they're, who they're considered en enemies with, you know, Saudi Arabia, human rights violations uh, on, amongst all courses, you know, uh, EAU and other countries as well, you know, they prop these. They don't invade, say, North, um, North Korea or other places with other human rights violations, yet Cuba stands out as an extra, extraordinary threat. Um, and so there's this false sort of dichotomy that happens with U.S. foreign policy, and really it's not too hard to see that you either follow the oil or you follow some other sort of ideological representation that they can't manage. And one of this representation they can't manage is this whole idea of, of, uh, of Chavismo, of the social revolution, an alternative to egalitarian capitalism that is blossoming within Latin America and has gone strong for the last 10 years. And Chavez really started this process with the Constitution uh, and my research was based upon the healthcare ad adaptation, the Cuban healthcare adaptation within Venezuela. And so in his constitution, he wanted to make healthcare as a human right, and I was very interested in see how he could do that, how he could implement something that was considered sui generis, the Cuban medical model, not seen as being something that could be applied outside the country. So I went there and I saw the evolution of it. Uh, well, I, I sort of, I read into the evolution of it and then I just talked, I talked with people from both sides of the spectrum, including the people that trained the poor, rural, and marginalized populations to become doctors and medical personnel of, for their own underserved communities. Because before that, access to universities and becoming a doctor or getting a medical education was out of the reach of the majority of the population within Venezuela. So now they're given the tools to achieve their own health needs and to serve their friends and family from their own underserved communities. And that's a huge change, especially in a health system that is so constructed upon a curative base where the proactive and preventative aspects of healthcare are underutilized within this sort of neoliberal paradigm of healthcare provision. It's more profitable to have healthcare on that other side of the spectrum because you just simply medicate problems. When you start dealing with healthcare as in a proactive, uh, preventative measure in a social healthcare system, you start to have to challenge the status quo start have to shift the ideology of healthcare towards just something you just merely cure, some, towards something that you have to challenge with housing uh, issues, sanitation issues, you know, literacy, all these things that are, contribute to the health needs of a population. And so it becomes a very activist, um, a very activist healthcare system, and that I think is also a challenge to the dominant um, ideology of, of the U.S., especially given the, the power of the transnational pharmaceutical industry. I'm not sure if you've seen John Oliver's clip on medicating doctors, but that was just hilarious if you get the chance to check that out. And so it's interesting, so with all this, with the healthcare system implemented from, based on a Cuban medical model, um, you have infant mortality being halved, um, mortality rate amongst ch children under five being halved, um, access to doctors in, access to doctors has increased from 19 doctors to 58. Uh, doctors per 10,000, and that's huge. This is very huge, and those doctors are representative of the populations that were underserved previously. And so this obviously presents a very, again, a very um, difficult model for the U.S. to try and argue against. So they're always looking for something uh, based upon human rights in this context. And it's an interesting model that they implement. Sort of, you get this 
the media going in there is because it's a media military industrial complex. It's no longer just a military industrial complex. The media starts couching sort of the evidence and the conversation, the anecdotal evidence about what's going on in Venezuela. And it's very work, works in concert with the US. And you saw this with Libya and Gaddafi. You saw this in Afghanistan. You saw this in Iraq. And so they control the dialogue, they manage the dialogue, and they really try and move it forward to push the next level of the agenda. And unfortunately, this example is very much in concert with the previous examples. You know, we're just, they're just starting this, the beginning steps in order to gaining uh, an ability to intervene or to use its allies in order to gain those resources. And I think it is worrying. It's very worrying on many levels. And so there is challenges within Mission Barrio Dentro, and there is challenges, Mission Barrio Dentro is the Cuban healthcare model, I probably forgot to say that. Mm -hmm. But there is challenges also with uh, in Venezuela, as John highlighted as well. And those challenges are emphasized as the beginning of that process towards delegitimizing the government in Venezuela. Um, and those are what get em emphasized away from the other side of the coin, which are those improved health indicators and uh, the, the social program. So this is where you get Pamela Simpson's, I'm, Pamela Simpson saying uh, Associated Press uh, that Chavez has invested Venezuela's oil wealth into social programs, uh, but those gains are meager compared with the sp spectacular construction of projects that oil riches spurned in the glittering Middle East cities, including the world's tallest building in Dubai, and plans for branches of the Louvre and Guggenheim Museum in Abu Dhabi. I mean, these kind of reports that come out really show an absolute disconnect. Not that like Fox News, you know, everybody can find their fa favorite Fox News blur, but. Fox News was trying to one-up. They tried it with this, which was signs of Hezbollah influence in Venezuela spreading throughout, Lat throughout South America. So there's an obvious That's complete awesome. disconnect with the reality of what's going on there, the presentation of you know, basic facts. But Canada also has this uh, going on as well. Maybe not as strongly coached in a complete sort of disconnect with reality, but only one side of the coin. You know, It's Venezuela's mismanaging its oil wealth. Uh, Venezuela's propping up Cuba um, Chavez used Petavisa, the, the state oil um, uh, oil company, for his own piggy bank, and yet a lot of this focus is like, oh, it's poor terms of trade. You know, he was being propped up, and I think Chavez really put this question forward to the opposition and other critics uh, against his his trade based upon solidarity. You give what you have, not what you have left over. He said. What would it cost if Venezuela had to instead contract the services of 30,000 medics from the United States or Europe to work in the barrios and the poorest towns, live alongside the indigenous populations, build the medical facilities, bring the equipment for the medical laboratories and operating theaters, and provide medicine? He continued by asking, how much would a capitalist country charge us to bring that size of an army of doctors and that sea of medicines to our people and be on call 24 hours a day? And no one has yet made a concrete argument against that. And can you imagine what Canada or the US would actually charge a country like Venezuela to provide that? It would be enormous, obviously. But as we touched on, the democracy also takes a hit, you know? There's this whole frame that it's not a democracy, Chavez is a dictator, and as we, you know, as this conversation has gone on, it's clear that um, card administration and everybody that is all the international bodies that have evaluated the electoral processes say it's one of the best in the world. It's out of 92, I think it was that Carter said it's the best out of those 92. So that's huge. Yeah, there's this framing of it, and then there's these hard policies as well being put into it. And one is the Cuban parole, um, Cuban medical parole program, which is what the U.S. uses to diffuse the sort of influence of the Cuban medical internationalism because. Cuba has operated in, in many countries, I think currently it's in 65, 66, 66 countries, uh, providing health care to rural poor marginalized populations uh, for free in many cases and then uh, with, with uh, uh, agreements in other cases so they provide health care also in Qatar, Saudi Arabia and South America, or South Africa, sorry, uh, for cost and then Haiti and other countries get it for free uh, and so it's sort of pay what you have. But the U.S. has also formed policies to try and undermine this, this example of a healthcare system. Um, and they've instituted this policy where a Cuban doctor can go to a U.S. embassy and automatically get transferred into being able to practice healthcare in the U.S. Uh, and likewise, there's the wet foot, dry foot, where a Cuban touches soil in the U.S., they get automatic uh, Cuban, or American citizenship uh, after a year if they stay on the soil. And so this is interesting because as a Canadian and and as a, a Canadian from a healthcare, back, uh, healthcare family, 
where I'm in contact with a lot of Canadian doctors and some that have migrated to the U.S., that that is simply not that easy, you know? It doesn't take, you know, a, a simple walking into a U.S. embassy and you're allowed to practice medicine in the U.S. So it's interesting how these policies and the dialogue have been shifted, have tried to shift sort of what Cuba represents and what now Venezuela represents, while systematically undermining it uh, in order to frame it this this way. And Michael Parmley of the U.S. Interest Section in Havana said that uh, on a cable in July 2006 that they were looking for human interest stories that undermine the, the myth of Cuban medical prowess. And so you have these policies, the desire working hand in hand with the mainstream media and the governments trying to undermine what Cuba is doing and what Venezuela is now doing, um, being supplemented by additional policies. And so, and so it's interesting because when a Two minutes left. So when, a, so when a Cuban doctor migrates, or uh, when a Cuban doctor migrates to the States, it's not for an increased wage, like say a Canadian doctor, which migrates at about 9 to 11%. The 2 to 3.4% of Cuban doctors that take up the Cuban medical parole program to migrate to the United States, that's framed as them fleeing tyranny and a dictator. And so you get to see how this model is really what's the threat to the US interests. Because as we said before, um, maternal, maternal mortality in half, poverty, extreme poverty rate um, declined by two-thirds, and the poverty rate was also cut in half. And yet, that dialogue is missed. The social programs are missed in this, in this whole sort of escalation of what is going to possibly amount to an extreme level of violence due to U.S. intervention in a country that is merely trying to provide for its own. And I think that is what we have to be cognizant of here, is it is not a threat to the U.S. No, that is an absolute joke. But it is a pattern of violence that is, it's like a skipping stone that has just started in Afghanistan, gone to Iraq, and gone to many other countries, and it is not seeming to want to stop. And this next, next part of that stone is going to skip on is looking to be Venezuela. And with that, I think we should be cognizant of what we can do as a group, as a society, to try and shift that dialogue with the information that we have on hand. Thank you. Um, I think uh, reducing infant mortality rate by 50%, uh, that represents for me a, a very dangerous example, the threat of, of, of what could be done if there was political will to introduce uh, a, a proper medical system. Um, our third uh, and final speaker this evening uh, is Kyla Sankey, who teaches at St. Mary's University, uh, and her topic uh, is... Um, Venezuela's 21st, socialism, 21st century socialism achievements and challenges. Kyla? Right. So, well, basically, my experience working with Venezuela has actually been working with um, the Bolivarian movement in Colombia. A lot of rural communities, a lot of labor unions who were part of the Bolivarian movement and who worked with the community organizations on the ground. So I'm going to give an overall view of the idea of the social forces and the Bolivarian movement which is behind the Venezuelan government and a very general overlook at the kind of social, political and economic transformations which have been achieved by Chavez, Chavez the government and the Bolivarian movement. Um, so the title of the speech is 21st, uh, Chavez's 21st Century Socialism, um, Advances and Challenges. And I, I guess I'm going to try and go against the myth which is also always being portrayed by the opposition that, well, on the one hand we've got this kind of, uh, the government of Chavez and increasingly Maduro are uh, portrayed as authoritarian, top-down, despotic communist regimes which are increasing their kind of erratic behaviour. Um, and also that the problems, the crisis in Venezuela is a result of this kind of political economic system of a socialist or Marxist communist regime. Um, there's actually quite a lot of irony that the, the economic critique of the Venezuela mo uh, model is, com is coming from uh, Capriles, the opposition, who's, um, they've tried to be quite quiet about what their alternative to, the Ch to Chavez and 21st socialism is, because what they actually suggest is a return to the neoliberal policies of privatization and tighter integration with the IMF and the World Bank. The irony of these policies is that it's exactly this type of structural, neoliberal structural reforms that were introduced in Venezuela in the 1980s 
and that generated such high degrees of poverty, mass exclusion, and anger that, that they led to mass uprisings and the Catacastle in 1989, um, and the consistent rejection in elections sit throughout the 1990s by the Venezuelan people um, of neoliberal policies, which were finally crystallized in the election of Hugo Chavez in 1998. Um, since the election of Chavez and Maduro, um, they have consistently combated these neoliberal policies uh, through a very interesting economic model, which has, on the one hand, um, sought to integrate Venezuela into the, um, the Venezuelan economy into the world market, basically as an oil exporting country. But at the same time, through anti-neoliberal reforms, which have sought to bring about an endogenous development model, extensive social welfare programs, and nationalization of key sectors of the economy, uh, most notably much higher state participation in oil. Um, the achievements of these anti-neoliberal neoliberal policies have been extensive, and we've already seen quite a few of them, so I won't go into it too much. But basically, he was able to tap uh, increase a massive windfall tax on oil profits and increase state participation um, in the oil, which has, between 1999 and two, 2013, brought in approximately $650 billion to social investment programs in Venezuela. Some of the best achievements have been cutting in half of poverty uh, between 2003 and 2008, from 54% to 27%. Uh, today, Venezuela is actually one of two of the least unequal societies in all of Latin America. According to the UNDP, uh, the United Nations Development Program, uh, Venezuela went from having a medium level of human development in 2000 of 0.66 to being a, a, um, to a high level of human development of 0.75 in 2012. Uh, We've already heard about their kind of massive increase in access to education and healthcare of the population, and also through a subsidised food program, which has brought um, cheap food to forty percent of the population. Um, okay. So what I'm going to look at now is, on the one hand, the kind of the social forces which are behind the Bolivarian movement and how the attempts to construct kind of this model of de uh, radical democracy and, and uh, democratic participation by the social basis of Chavez's movement. And on the other hand, the way that this has been integrated with the idea of the construction of an alternative capitalist economy, um, which Chavez later described as 21st century socialism. Um, so I guess the point, the why I focus on these two aspects is that in the media you get too much of an emphasis on the idea that it's Chavez and Maduro as kind of these big political centralizing the, um, politicians going against kind of the US and everything. But actually, Chavez and Maduro have just actually been the figureheads behind what is a much deeper social process of radicalization and the development of radical conscientiousness within Bolivarian society, which has come to be known as a Bolivarian process. Um, as I already mentioned, this stem, you, you can really identify this as stemming back to the Caracaso in the 1980s, uh, which were these mass uprisings by the in lots of different parts of the informal sectors of society. So rural inhabitants, slum inhabitants, um, employees of small businesses. There's no work, um, organized working class behind these movements. A lot, of, a lot of the protests were of a kind of defensive, sporadic, or spontaneous nature, um, which had a lot of different currents operating within them. Every kind of influences of everything from Che Guevara to Trotsky, uh, theories of national liberation, uh, indigenous movements, Afro-Venezuelan <coughs> and Mestizo resistance. But Chavez's Bolivarianism has actually been the strongest force which has articulated all of these various currents within these mass uprisings. Um, and moreover, we've got to understand that these have, all these social forces have actually pushed forward the Chavez government. When he was first elected into power in 1988 and came to power in 1999, um, his program was not actually particularly radical. 
Um, it was an idea of giving neoliberalism a human face, um, attracting private capital, and kind of increasing social redistribution of welfare. Um, but what happened was it was this kind of key turning point in 2002 uh, when, as we've already talked about, this kind of the CIA-backed coup of 2002 and then this nine-week strike and employers lock out the oil economy, which kind of completely crippled the economy uh, through 2002, 2003. What happened in, uh, during that kind of crisis time was this kind of rise up of massive street protests, uh, community mobilizations, workers and soldiers who came to restore Chavez to power and defeat this employer strike on the oil economy in 2002. And after those forces came in support of Chavez, they were able to, be, to work behind him in all, in, and push for a much greater radicalization uh, of the economic structures of the, of the Venezuelan society. And what Chavez and Maduro have tried to do is to articulate, to bring forward, um, to, to act as an articulation of these social forces to be able to push forward for change to bring about structural transformation within Venezuelan society. Um, Chavez has pushed for the establishment of um, much great, of much better dem democratic spaces within, Venezue in, within Venezuelan society, um, which allow for political participation <coughs> and decision making, which go way beyond our normal ideas of two-party uh, electoral dem democratic systems. These are systems of direct democracy. Um, there are lots of these programs, but the most interesting of them are maybe the Mesa Técnicas and the Consejos Comunitarios, uh, which are basically um, community-run self-management um, organizational councils where local communities take this, take, are able to manage and control decisions made over things like local services, so water, gas, energy, electricity, um, access to health, education, and food distribution. Uh, in 1995, when Chavez announced in the World Social Forum that he was going to move towards a model of 21st century socialism, these community councils and, te and uh, technical tables were actually the fifth pillar of Chavez's um, 21st century socialism. And the figures that I have is that since then, 26,000 of these community councils have been created. Um, but The purpose of these councils was also was not only to bring about kind of radical uh, new forms of radical democracy, but also to integrate this with a structural and productive transform transformation within Venezuelan society. So, um, what you've got is the move towards a, a very unequal and concentrated oil economy, towards a diversified productive base within uh, Venezuelan society based on the diversification of the economic sectors, as well as much greater social redistribution um, of the wealth. The most important sector of that was within the oil, with, within the oil economy, so greater taxation on oil, um, but also much more state participation in the way oil was managed, uh, the use of oil to kind of to boost other sectors of the Venezuelan economy, so things like uh, fertilizers and other petrol-based uh, products, and the other, and as well as that, he also tried to reduce the dependence of Venezuela on the U.S. So he diversified trade and investment links uh, with away from the U.S. towards other countries like China, Brazil, and Russia. Um, but I guess besides just uh, having uh, keeping the kind of oil economy, what he all, the most interesting experiment that Chavez tried to move for was much more diversified economic base of the, the economy. So uh, massive nationalizations, nationalizations, for example, of the cement, electricity, telecommunications, and steel industries, um, land reform. So expropriating millions of acres of farmland from speculators as well as processing plants in the project to, to bring about food sovereignty within Venezuela in basic staple foods like milk, meat, vegetables, 
and poultry. Um, the purpose, obviously, was to kind of bring about not only a kind of political transformation of Venezuelan society, but also integrate this political transformation with economic and structural transformation to kind of move away the productive base of the Venezuelan society from unequal, concentrated oil economy towards a diversified economy. But also, he had to do this kind of diverse, he had to diversify the economic structures of the society to reduce the vulnerability to the, econ the, the practices of economic sabotage, the planned shortages, the distribution blockages, and the politically induced economic decisions um, of business owners or the capitalist class who were trying to undermine the policies of Chavez and Maduro, as has already been discussed. Um, okay, so if that was the basic model that they've been working towards, I think that it's important to emphasize some of the most important problems that they've come up with. Uh, the first of them has been that they, inher this, they inherited this rentier state, uh, basically a non-functioning capitalist state characterized by links of clientelism, corruption, and increasing bureaucratization that has consistently held back the transformations, thank you, uh, that they've tried to implement in, in the Venezuelan uh, politi uh, politi uh, political and economic structures of Venezuela. Uh, often these blockages on the, the transformations of their cynicism and disillusionment of the base. Um, in order to move forward, the, uh, the, Maduro, the Maduro government is going to have to use, try to kind of give more power to these communal councils in order to fight the bureaucracy and um, bring about kind of radical grassroots power as opposed to kind of um, the blockaging power of this kind of over, um, clientelistic and corrupt state, um, and to push for more social transformations. But I guess the most important problem that's been, that's been faced in Venezuelan society is that really that it, they haven't managed to diversify the economy at all. In the, since when Chavez came to power, the dependence on oil exports has actually increased from 69% to 96% of exports in the last 15 years. Um, on top of that, industry has actually decreased in the economy from 17% to 13%, and 70% of food in Venezuela is actually imported, um, which has meant that even though the cooperatives <coughs> and local councils have been really, really important initiatives by the Chavez government, they've continued to be completely dependent on oil rents, um, and which means that they follow the boom-bust cycles of oil prices in the Venezuelan economy. And also there's this, there's this um, I guess there's this big threat that they're just, instead of actually being a model of kind of genuine radical, radical political and economic transformation, they just, beca they just become the kind of mechanism for boosting a consumerist society whereby oil revenues go to boost kind of the massive uh, increased consumption capacity of Venezuelan society and people just become dependent on kind of social welfare programs and then they become they themselves become linked to kind of structures of clientelism and um, corruption and kind of just you know within the voting machines essentially um, this is linked to the fact that economic power has not been um, taken out of the hands of the main elites of Venezuelan society, so banking, oil, and processing plants, who have actually increased their wealth in the past 15 years, given the commodities boom that's been going on. Um, and finally, the failure to diversify the Venezuelan economy has been linked to the, pro the massive problem, which is really at the root of the crisis at the moment, which is inflation, um, which numbers put it at anywhere between kind of 68% and 160%, um, which means that when, I mean, basically what's happened is with the drop of oil prices, the government budget has dropped, which means it's been unable to, to um, continue its subsidized food imports pr um, program. So basically there's large amounts of money which are chasing small amounts of goods in Venezuela, which is driving up prices. There's also a lot of corruption and black market uh, kind of dealings going on. So the subsidized food programs are going into, are just going over the border into Colombia, where they've been made a profit. Um, and they've also got problems with uh, the different exchange rates 
and the kind of huge subsidies that they've got on petrol prices in Venezuela. Um, I won't go on anymore. <laughs> I had more to say, but I won't say it. Um, it's, but I guess just to emphasize what I was trying to say in my speech is that on the one hand, you've got this incredible experience of popular participation, mass mobilization, and the radicalization of, um, of social consciousness in Venezuela. Um, but ha that has not been matched by uh, kind of productive and social transformation in the rentier state and the economic structures of Venezuelan society. So the question that I'm trying to make in this speech is, is there still a space for maneuver for 21st century socialism in Venezuela? Uh, as you can see, this is a very complex, contradictory situation uh, in Venezuela. Um, what I would like to remind you about is the petition which is floating around. Uh, Errol, is there another one there? Where's the other one, please? The other petition? They're, both, they're all here. Okay. Uh, if you ag agree that uh, President Obama has made a slight error of judgment, uh, he's, he said, and I quote, that the situation in Venezuela constitutes an unusual and extraordinary threat to the national security and foreign policy of the United States, and I hereby declare a national emergency to deal with that threat. If you disagree with the President, please feel free to sign the petition. Nine million people have signed this already, nine million, mainly in Venezuela. I think it'd be nice to have a little bit of uh, uh, Halifax content too, mm -hmm. so please feel free to add your name to it. Um, come time for you folks to ask questions. I'd like to ask you please to direct questions to, to the members of the panel and I'll take maybe two or three and then we'll, we'll show them around and then go to the next round. I'd like you to ask to make, uh, uh, to raise questions, not comments. And I'd also like you to introduce yourself so that we can get to know each other. So, um, why not? We're in Nova Scotia. <laughs> okay, so, uh, any questions uh, for, the, for the panel? Yes. Yes, that, that, that guy with the earring, yes. Hi, yeah, Bob Hewish from Dallas University. Clarification for this, question for Carla. Um, with the Cuban Medical Parole Program, the, the problem at the top that makes it even worse is that when the Cuban doctors and the Cuban trained doctors actually come to the U.S. at 1,500 so far, you're actually disqualified to even work in the U.S. That's really the thing, is so that you have these, these guys who are working in rural areas, and they wind up what, you know, in Miami and Austin, unlicensed by the state boards, you can only push them off. And then, you know, you compound on top of that, but nothing goes back to those rural areas to, to get back. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's bad, and it's worse all at once, right? Uh, so kind of one of the things that came with, in my mind when you were speaking there is, You've got this elite control of wealth still in Venezuela, and that's shaking things up and creating all this tension. I sort of thought, well, <coughs> Cuba went through the same struggle in the early 1960s with the elite trying to control and trying to hold things together. And one of the solutions was, okay, go, get out. Uh, is there any discussion in Venezuela about actually encouraging some of that capital flight and say, you know, just get out of the country and we'll handle it from here? Okay, uh, so Larry had a question. Yeah, before I do though, I just wanted to make sure everybody knows about the public forum tomorrow night here <laughs> about healthcare. I just, you know, couldn't <laughs> avoid the opportunity. The, my, my question is uh, Cuba's um, dilemma in all of this. Uh, Cuba's just had the, the offer by the United States to um, regularize relations <coughs> And it's kind of like the Americans are shaking hands with the Cubans and then beating their little brother over the head. Doesn't this create a huge problem for the Cubans? And what do they do about it? Okay. One more question, then we'll. Yes. Um, hi, I'm, hi I'm, I'm I'm Jackie Barkley. Um, I I guess my question is um, is for Kyla. Um, and for you, and we're close to the same age, so I'm so embarrassed. I can't even remember your name, please. Uh, John. Sorry, John. <laughs> What's your name? Jackie. I'm, Jackie. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm embarrassed. Speak up to you. Uh, uh, my, my question is, my, my question is um, 
it's perhaps too big or too fat of a question, but given, it, like, while it's very important for us to, uh, I was privileged to go to Venezuela, which I really, really appreciate, a very short trip, but while it's really important for us to listen to and build solidarity with experiments uh, that are going on among our brothers and sisters in Cuba and Venezuela, my question for both of you in a um, third world province of Canada with a budget that we're facing in 48 hours that will make neoliberalism in Nova Scotia look like small potatoes. Um, what are the lessons that we have to learn in solidarity with this struggle for the impact of, of our neighbors here? Uh, for the impact on our struggle here, on our economy here. That's what I'm trying to ask. What are the lessons, what are the relationships, other than just of solidarity? Well, just. Lots to talk about. Okay. Pardon? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, for the uptake on what's going on in the, with, oh. for the uptake with regards to just Cuban medical graduates, there's definitely there's lack of uptake in, in different states as different states have different regulations with regards to it. But the Cuban graduates are recognized by the Educational Commission for Foreign Medical Graduates as well as the uh, medical board at in California, which has the highest U.S. standards, and so if they do go and they apply to work there and they pass the board exams, yeah, then they can work anywhere in, in the U.S. And so it just depends sort of where they land uh, when they do get to the U.S. and do challenge the board exams. So if they get certified under California, then they can sort of disperse throughout the U.S. So it's just interesting where they land because most of them want to go to Miami, obviously with the highest Cuban population and their support system. So that can be part of the problem. Hey, uh, two, two really hard questions there. Um, so first of all, okay, this question about kind of why not just expropriate all the um, all the kind of like main kind of economic motors of Venezuelan society from the elite. Uh, that sounds like a nice policy. Um, the problem, and um, you know, why is, why are they doing it differently from Cuba? Why not just follow like Cuba? Um, I remember that Chavez tried to launch a coup himself in 1992. Uh, that coup failed. Chavez was imprisoned and he had, and since the failure of the coup, he's had to try to implement all of the, his reforms by, via kind of political and electoral means, which has very much limited his mandate. He's never been able to go forward without having very strong support from the social base and in the electoral ballots. Um, on the, so, on the one hand, the other hand is that you know, kind of, you've got the U.S. completely surrounding Venezuela with kind of military warships in the Caribbean, and, the, and um, from the side of Colombia, you've got seven military bases. So he's got to, he's all Chavez and Namudo have always had to play their cards very, very carefully. Um, they've tried to push forward for much stronger changes within with the. Um, the change in the constitution in 2008 that failed by a margin of 250,000 votes or just less than 1%, that would have allowed him to implement much more radical reforms that would have kind of moved towards a much bigger transformation towards a socialist economy, but it failed. So the political and electoral forces just haven't been there to be able to do that kind of thing. And if they tried to do it now, it would just bring in, it would be the breaking point. How does this impact our struggle, Jackie? Um, well, like, I think that there are two important points here. I mean, the first one is the, uh, the fact that our governments, you know, the British government, the Canadian government, and the US government have all been involved in trying to overthrow the Maduro government. And so at a very basic point, what we can do is try to say that we're there and we understand what's going on and to kind of hold back these governments from afar. Um, as a, as a kind of immediate and simple point. But I suppose also what we can learn is these kind of these experiences of building grassroots democracy, building up new uh, spaces of kind of political participation, self-management, and how, the, how this kind of idea of the way that social movements and kind of new economic structures can be articulated with kind of structural transformation 
and transformations of the state as well. So the lessons. Isaac? Yeah. So before I come answer uh, the Cuba question, the whole point about uh, the expropriation and, this, in a sense, the seizure of state power has been, uh, uh, in terms of Venezuela, sort of like the the devil, right? The demon that's bedeviled the, the left in terms of trying to understand the constraints that Venezuela operates in. Cuba, in a difficult situation, in a different situation, was not only able to seize the state but destroy it and create a new state in its place. But they had a different correlation of social forces, right? And it was the historical conjuncture was very different than for Venezuela. Uh, in terms of Cuba's predicament, which uh, the question that Larry asked, uh, many people, you know, predicted, right, that this left Cuba. You read editorials in, in different um, major newspapers that said Cuba was now in a predicament. What were they going to do, right? Okay, they so desperately needed uh, this relationship with the United States. Was how it was portrayed. And what's interesting is an article just recently came out, well, not an article, the uh, Cuban minister, uh, minister of Foreign Investment, right, just came out and said, well, you know, you know, we welcome U.S. investment, but it will be done on the same basis that we, we have to deal with investment from other countries. It will be vetted, um, and we will see whether it gives us a benefit or not, right? So I think people have overstated, you know, the, 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 the need, I mean, Cuba obviously needed to have this hostility with the United States, at least formally and in some diplomatic sense. But I think people overestimated uh, the, uh, the, the um, <coughs> or this, or mis completely misunderstood, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the Cuban revolutions, defense of sovereignty and internationalism and so forth. Within this, Cuba wanted this hostility to the end, but they're not going to surrender their independence and sovereignty. And a very important part of the Cuban revolution uh, was not just simply this attempt to domestically construct socialism, whether, it's, you know, whether you believe it's socialism or not, but they also saw internationalism as being very significant to fulfilling revolutionary goals and also constructing socialism in itself. I mean, of Fidel Castro once said that, you know, you, if you can't ex, um, express, I'm sort of paraphrasing, solidarity for people outside of your country, how can you have solidarity inside your country? So internationalism was seen as a very important part of Cuba's raison d'etre, um, a very important part of building socialism. So one of the things that really stood out was as soon as these sanctions, and, you know, must, Obama I mean, obviously was thinking, you know, I've solved the issue with Cuba, I'm going to get accolades, Latin America will now open its arms to me, right? And now I'll deal with Venezuela, right? And, you know, basically speaking, and I'm going to, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to win, you know, be shower with the flowers. And what happened was, you know, one of the first countries that came out with one of the strongest statements was Raul Castro. Very clearly, the Cuban government clearly stood with Venezuela and condemned this. Because if, um, the Cuban government understands very clearly that this new normalization or this move to normalization of, normalization of relations with the island has nothing to do with recognizing, you know, Cuba's right to independence and sovereignty and self determination Yes, it's recognized in a formal way, but it's about a, a, achieving the same goal, the same strategic goal that was under Eisenhower, that was under Kennedy, that was carried under all these successive administrations by different means and so forth. And Cuba has put a lot of effort, uh, resources, time, ideological, and what have you, into building this anti-imperialist wave across Latin America and so forth. I think at one stage you could say the Cubans, you know, there's a famous thing where when, when uh, Cuba was sending all these doctors, uh, medical personnel to Latin America, when Fidel was writing his reflections, you know, he said you can hear these words where people say, why send doctors to Bolivia while we have, you know, while we're reducing the number of doctors here, right? And he made a comment like some people don't understand um, how a strategic failure in policy can have devastating consequences, right? Cuba, in a sense, rolled the dice. They gambled, right? That here's this anti-imperialist wave running through Latin America, and our future lies with that. And if you go back to the de first and second declarations of Havana from the 1960s, the Cuban Revolution very early on tied itself to this anti-imperialist wave in Latin America, to Latin America achieving some sort of liberation from imperialist rule. Now you have this concrete manifestation. How long will it last? Is it <coughs> lasting? Will it, um, you know, can it be overturned? We, we don't know, right? Nobody can predict the history. But Cuba very clearly, I don't think, has a contradiction with this um, normalization that the U.S. is attempting with them, whatever it means, and standing full square against Obama's sanctions, right? It fits in perfectly. There's no contradiction. I think it fits in perfectly uh, with the international solidarity and their commitment to Latin American independence. This has been very clearly a spine of Cuban foreign policy, and it was very clearly demonstrated when Cuba came out very full square in support of Venezuela and condemning the U.S. policies. Uh, one. Oh, you said uh, two, uh, three, four, five. Oh, let's go with five, okay? And we'll do a, a, a quickie. Uh, one, what is that? Okay. I wanted to ask Chris, um, this book that you have written, tomorrow night there's going to be a meeting here on health care in Canada. 
what does this book tell that meeting they should do about health care in Canada? Okay. The, can, I, can I have a supplementary question? <laughs> if it's related. Uh, so, no, <laughs> it's a publisher. It's a publisher. <laughs> the, we, we talk a lot about the elections that Chevis and Maduro won. The one that they lost may have been the most, one of the more significant elections because it, as you said, it, it, it prevented them from going forward with some of those social programs. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's useful for us to look at why they lost that election. Uh, two? Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Douglas and I'm Venezuelan, born and raised. Um, my point of view is slightly different from the one from the panelists tonight. And, uh, however, I do appreciate the solidarity and all the love for, for my country because that's something that uh, you can be uh, upset or anything about. However, um, I just wanted to ask three uh, quick questions. and They're more about, uh, I guess, fruit for thought rather than the panelists. If you would like to respond, I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, but first of all, I don't know if uh, any of the panelists or you guys are aware that uh, the Venezuelan government passed a law recently uh, that enables the uh, police and the military to use lethal weapons against um, a peaceful uh, process and uh, manifestations on the street right now. As a consequence, many students have been shot in the head in the past few months. Um, also, in many countries around the world, uh, gatherings like these are happening. Uh, and whenever a Venezuelan person uh, says anything against the government or different from what it's being portrayed to the, to the world, uh, things happen to our families back home. Uh, we're not politicians, we're just regular Joes that manage to get out of the country, but things happen to our families. And third, uh, um, uh, the, the list that you guys are signing right now, um, it's being signed by many Venezuelans in, uh, right now. Um, and uh, it's actually when you go to buy at the supermarkets in Venezuela, uh, controlled by the government, uh, you have to sign if you want to get food. So it's not um, like something as basic and as elemental as getting food depends on signing a list that the government is controlling. So just wanted to leave those. Okay. If I could editorialize, um, we don't. We, we'll give you food whether you sign or not. Um, <laughs> here, 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 there. here, here, there. Okay. Yeah. You're in Canada. This yeah. is a Canadian audience. We have Canadian concerns. Uh, I also would like to suggest uh, that uh, if you look at what the the, the MUD has said, uh, they have also supported it. So, so if you want to sign it, feel free to do so because. Uh, people who are opposed to the government have said that they disagree with the with the, the policy of, of Obama. Yeah, so, definitely. And I don't care for intervention yeah. of the U.S. in my country. Like, yeah. I, well, I just so, sign the country. petition then. If you, yeah. don't, if you don't want that, sign the <laughs> petition. I challenge you. Uh, who was number three, please? Okay, yeah. Uh, in Chris, mm -hmm. I'm also Venezuela. Okay. And um, I was a med student my question is, if you think that the Chavez government wanted to give equality and improve our human development, then why Chavez preferred to bring human doctors instead of improving our medical doctors, like in Venezuela? And after that, even when he created the, the new university that had a healthcare program, why he still kept forgetting about the current universities that offer medicine. Like for many years and still now our universities are struggling with budget. Like I was in med school and we didn't have the chance to work with real cadavers because we didn't have the proper budget. So, that's Thank you made the question. Number four please. Number four. Yeah, Tim. Okay, I think, uh, introduce yourself please. <laughs> okay, yeah, my name is Kevin here. Uh, uh, one of the most troubling things about the anti-government uh, actions, demonstrations, whatever you want to call them, for the past year has been the use of uh, snipers. I think 50 people have been killed, half of them opposing the government, a lot of them were police. And a lot of people feel that the, the, there was the use of snipers to kill uh, police. And in fact, 
many people theorize that this was the same strategy used in Kiev during the overthrow of the government in Ukraine. You know, it's just my question is, uh, do you have any information regarding this aspect um, and, and further information? Okay. And there's another five. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my question is uh, more around the uh, political machine behind the Chavez movement. Um, and the Chavez coalition is not uh, one political party. It's made up of multiple political parties with different views. It takes a pluralist approach to left-wing organizing. And sorry, my name's Kyle. I'm the president of the Halifax Dartmouth District Labor Council. Um, I, I'm wondering if you can comment on that pluralism within the, Chav uh, the Chavista coalition and how that's played out electorally, because there have been moments where Chavez has merged political parties, he's declared that he hates political parties on the left, and then they've been brought back under the electoral umbrella for elections. I'm just wondering if folks can comment on that, uh, the role of pluralism in the Chavista coalition. Okay, and our water carrier, yeah, number six, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll throw in your question. Water carrier, this is a coffee urn, and yeah. hopes you don't notice that it's not a <laughs> carafe. Um, what do you mean? My name's Alan, I'm with No Harbor for War, and I encourage people to take a copy of our newsletter here, which has a center spread on uh, Venezuela. But I also wanted to, to tie it in with the front page article on the uh, newsletter, which here as Canadians, we have this Bill C-51, which is to increase the repressive apparatus of the Canadian state, uh, increase the powers of the uh, Security Services, the, uh, formerly called the SS, uh, now uh, CSIS, uh, and very many things, and I want to draw attention that there is a, a second in a mass uh, Halifax rallies against Bill C-51. But I also want to speak as a Haligonian in that in three days' time, a warship from this city left here on New Year's Eve, is going to be taking part in an extremely large war exercise off the coast of Scotland. And as you know, so I'm using that as like part of the ongoing war preparations of the Canadian state. And we have to tie in with CF-18s, etc. So how is the Venezuelan people dealing with security issues when there is so much attempt to uh, destabilize the situation. Harper's answer here is C-51, war ab abroad, repression uh, of uh, democratic rights uh, internally. So how is, how is Venezuela dealing with these profound uh, attempts to dis destabilize? Uh, Chris, if you could go first, please. There were two questions that were raised specifically about healthcare, and then Errol had a supplementary. Please, please, if you could. Gotcha. All right, Errol. Um, what does this book tell Canada about healthcare? There's a number of things, but I'll just list off the sort of top three that came right away. Uh, removing barriers that keep rural poor and marginalized from attending their own health needs, and so that's the removal of uh, tuition, creating uh, admission sucre, the free education uh, program, and putting a medical education body in that. Um, so that people that were primarily caretakers uh, could not afford to go, and even geographically decentralizing the medical education system to more rural areas, uh, so they're able to attend attend university and, and become doctors uh, in there. So making it more accessible, um, and reversing the medical migration pipeline, because Canada is very complicit in taking the countries that need their healthcare providers the most. Uh, and forming policies that fast tracks those healthcare workers to work in Canada um, as opposed to actually capacitating the basic health needs of their own country. Um, so Canada is very much complicit in this and Venezuela and Cuba are taking a different approach and it's the scale up of 100,000 medical uh, personnel from rural poor and marginalized populations in developing countries. So ALAM <coughs> is the main training university in, um, in Cuba for foreign medical personnel. Uh, so it's not for the domestic population in Cuba, and uh, the University of Salvador de Allende uh, in Caracas is also being used to train medical personnel uh, from other countries in order to go and serve the health needs in other countries, not for their domestic population. So it's an interesting conception because we just parachute our healthcare personnel and also just and then and then remove them at a moment's notice. It's not about capacitation or building up the healthcare program or the health or the public health system. 
uh, we sort of just parachute in, do our thing, and then leave, whereas Cuba is about training and capacitating um, the places that they go and they serve. So I think that that's a very important. Also, it's a different type of healthcare, and, and it's, it's not healthcare in a fragmented sense. The healthcare providers themselves work as a team. There's not sort of this false hierarchy as well. Um, and so often, in, in the case of Venezuela, they work in CDIs, consultorial diagnosticos integrales. Um, and the medical personnel, if you go there, you, it's a very patient-centered approach, and you would be seen by, say, a doctor, and if you needed to be referred for blood work, you'd just walk over into the blood work room, or a physiotherapist, or a, psych or a psychiatrist, uh, or whatever you needed, um, all within one hospital, whereas here in Canada, you know, we have to call, all right, you need to go see a specialist, you need to go see a doctor, or you need to go and do rehabilitation, so that might take a week, that might take another week to rebook, and then it might take another week for your x-ray x-rays or whatever else comes through. So we have a very fragmented system that is leaning towards a more and more privatized model of healthcare, which puts the locus of health outside of the people that are most vulnerable to um, pathologies of poverty and pathologies of inequality. And I think that's something that we can learn from Venezuela. With regards to medical student back there, um, uh, improve healthcare. Why bring Cuban doctors instead of training and rebuilding uh, their universities in Venezuela? Um, it's interesting because there's, uh, like, Venezuela really got devastated by the structural adjustment programs, like healthcare-wise, and it was also it was also told to focus on the the, the curative aspects of healthcare and the and the privatized healthcare systems with the agreements to, to the loans and structural adjustments, especially one specific one, El Paquet. You know the structural adjustment program. Uh, it's called the package, essentially in Venezuela. But that was really devastating to not only your healthcare system, but how you were constructing healthcare as well. And so it, it got it got put in the locus of health in a very curative uh, aspect. And so it's really hard to take care of the health needs in a proactive, preventative sense because <coughs> you're basically told that um, in order to get this World Bank or IMF loan, you need to do just devastate your entire healthcare system and only work in a triage manner. And additionally, um, why Cuban docs coming in and training, it was just important to capacitate and scale up as, as rapidly as possible. There's no other country in the world that has as many, as many doctors serving abroad. So Cuba, for a population of 11.1 million, has 82,000 doctors. Uh, Canada, for a population three times as much, has 3,000 less doctors, only 79,000. So that's why Cuba is going in there. And they're not there to just take the jobs. They're not there to take any jobs. They're there to scale up entirely the healthcare system as much as possible uh, in response to a devastating health need, the Vargas tragedy in 99. And so uh, when Chavez made a call for help because he really wanted to implement healthcare as a human right, he couldn't get enough of the domestic healthcare population, whether they were just busy with their own private practices or their public practices. He was unable to get enough people for the displaced people of 300,000 from the, that de devastating landslide. Um, as well as anywhere between estimates, I think, was 2,000 to 50,000 people dead. I mean, it was huge. And I'm sure you guys obviously would know of it. Um, and so that created a response to getting the Cubans there. Um, why Cubans also? They don't hesitate to serve in the most rural, poor, and marginalized populations. And, and in Canada, we, we struggle with this as well, to capacitate our own populations to serve themselves. Instead, we're expecting the the top 25% or the top 50% of our socioeconomic population to go and serve in rural poor and marginalized populations sort of this idea of either you're a missionary, you do that just based upon your own free will, or you do that because you're a mercenary, you're going there for the ton of cash, the rural stipend. And so it was important to scale up that much uh, very rapidly in order to sort of make this whole idea of healthcare as a human right. Um, and a lot of those universities weren't accessible for the most poor world and marginalized populations in Venezuela. So it was really, I think it's a really important sort of lesson to take out. And I know that uh, universities are struggling, universities are struggling in Canada too. But that one important sort of conception and how utilizing the Cuban medical know-how and implementing a new system um, that can actually bring in people from those, those vulnerable areas to serve themselves is a really important model to sort of take note of and be cognizant of. But the Cubans are already moving on to Brazil um, because Brazil has been uh, in, in a new program, Mass Med, Mayas Medicos, uh, as well as other countries. So even before the whole evolution of, of, of Cuba's tenure within Venezuela, they've already been called to do other jobs in, in uh, other neighboring countries in Latin America. So that's why Cuba. Okay, Isaac? Uh, I, I mean, it's questions of, of, uh, based on Venezuela. These are the specialists of Venezuela. 
But I just think there's an interesting aspect also to look at as well, uh, um, which is often ignored because you know the historic origin of capitalism is necessarily tainted with a racial order, right? And I think it's also important to sort of, if you get, to look at the way, for example, indigenous people and even black Venezuelans have been empowered. They, they historically marginalized them. One of the things that always stood out is, basically speaking, that there is this feeling from the elite, this oligarchy that's been parasitic, this uh, kleptocracy, right? That they are the ones who are meant to rule. And this conception of who is a citizen who has a right to participate in decision making has is very narrow racially speaking. And I think one of the things that's emerged in Latin America, but if anyone understands Latin America, it's quite often underestimated, is this kind of racial stratification, right? Uh, you know, there's so many different ways by which people are classified according to skin color and so forth. So I think it's important that people who are have been spit upon, who have been denigrated, who have had no particular role, whether in Venezuela or even in Bolivia, and I think it's important to appreciate this as well, are suddenly reaffirming themselves, suddenly having dignity. And I think one of the important points is to bear in mind that quite often, it's not only the oligarchy who sees themselves, even though they continue to have economic power, see themselves suddenly confronting uh, uh, political people, right? People in political positions and in spaces never thought would ever have this role. It's important to understand there's also this deeply charged racism, right? This cheap charged idea that these are people who are there to be the hewers and drawers of water, not to have any role um, in any um, in political decision making. And one, have to only, one only has to, re, um, to recall the horrific, um, debased and very terrible images of, of Chavez portrayed as a monkey, um, to basically play into that racially charged um, historic climate that exists in Latin America, that here is somebody coming from the darker races who aren't really human beings, right, who are there basically to serve our interests, who suddenly are violating this divinely ordained structure and suddenly uh, 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 have pretenses to actually participate in real decision making. And I think the last point to be made here is it's interesting to have this debate about what's going on in Venezuela. What kind of society has been built? Is it socialism or is it not socialism? In my discussions with Cubans, which I do a lot of work on, you know, Cubans would often tell me, what the hell is this socialism of the 21st century, right? What does it mean, right? But that's a separate debate than defending the right of a country from being, having foreign interference in its affairs. I mean, if we talk about countries in economic crisis, I just read a stat where Jamaica, for example, and you have Haiti, the two poorest countries in the Caribbean. I don't see anyone saying they're a threat um, to, uh, to US um, security and so forth. So I think one of the fundamental things, whatever our debates we have about the nature of the Bolivarian Revolution, the fundamental right of a people to decide their affairs without interference from external powers is an invaluable principle that we have to stand up to support. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I haven't got that much to add. Uh, thanks, Isaac. Um, going back to the question on, you know, why did you know, this constitu the constitutional reform of 2008, why was it lost? Um, well, you know, it was 250,000 votes that they lost it by, but at the same time, there was a lot of abstention by a lot of the traditional bases of, the Ch of um, Chavez at the time. Um, I think that on the one hand, People saw this as kind of great social advances within the kind of Bolivarian revolution. This, I mean, it was a 36-hour working week that they tried to implement, massive improvements in labor conditions, and really strong advances of um, gender equality that he was trying to implement with this constitutional reform. But at the same time, it was seen as uh, an attempt to increase his presidential power and with much greater centralization of political power and kind of the unlimited possibility of re-election of presidential terms. So I think that that was probably the reason why it didn't get pushed through in the end. Um, to emphasize a little bit, the, the violence has been mentioned now. Um, okay, just to, just to kind of say that the protest has, you know, the protest and the violence has been on both sides. It's been kind of, um, Ch um, Chavista government um, police and protesters against kind of anti-Chavistas and the other way around. But uh, to go on to the issue of snipers, one thing that is no, it's pretty evident is that there's been the use of very professional snipers from the anti-Chavista camps. Uh, they've had a long-standing policy of infiltrating Colombian paramilitaries into Venezuela and using kind of weapons which are of a really, really high quality. And it looks like that that's been happening with, um, in the assassinations against the Chavistas from the anti-Chavista camp. Um, and yeah, 43 people have been killed from that. Within the question of 
political pluralism? Well, that's a really interesting question. Probably better for a kind of a longer discussion that we can have at another time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just to say that, yeah, this is probably the most interesting thing about the Bolivarian movement, is that it's become this real articulating force of so many different currents, which comes together at key moments, but at the same time is really expressive of a lot of different um, ideas and political persuasions within Latin America. So that's something that's really important. It's kind of a unification force of the Bolivarian movement. Um, you can see there's a security guard who's about to kick us out. Um, <laughs> at 8.30, everybody has to physically leave. You might have seen people heading downstairs. So I apologize. Yes, Henry. Just you make it really quick because we're about to be kicked out. Yes. Just a little footnote on the last election. It's really good to put 